Alrighty, so here we go. I'll just repeat one, one more time. Um, if you have any questions during the presentation, please write them in the Q&A box, not in the chat, because it's easier for us to keep track uh, of your questions and others can see your questions and the answers. Uh, this webinar is going to be recorded and we will share the recording and the slides by email within the next few days. And if you're using social media and would like to post any of the content that you see here today, please use the hashtag um, CrossRefUpdate23. So here is our agenda for today. Um, in today's session, we will be covering several key updates since our annual meeting. Amanda will discuss the integrity of the scholarly record, which we refer to as ISR, in light of some of the feedback we've heard from the community. We'll talk about changes to, cited, to the cited by service and how it relates to registering references. Uh, and we're also excited to provide an overview of the lab's participation reports along with a demo. And Patricia will present the latest results of the metadata priority survey, um, which resulted in valuable insights uh, into areas of focus for future initiatives. And we hope uh, at the end, we can discuss some reflections on metadata completeness um, with you all at the end of the meeting. Let me introduce to you our team that will be speaking with you today. I am Rosa Maurice Clark, Communications and Events Manager. And joining me today is Patricia Feeney, Head of Metadata, Martin Richman, Product Manager, Rachel Lamy, Director of Product, and Amanda Bartel, Head of Member Experience. And we're also gonna have uh, Cora Korsek, who's Head of communic the Communications and Engagement Team, and she'll be monitoring the Q&A. So we'd love to hear from you too. And again, if you haven't yet, please introduce yourself to everyone in the chat. Uh, we hope the meeting uh, will be welcoming and inclusive of everyone um, according to our code of conduct. Please let us know if uh, there are any concerns. So let's get started. I'm going to pass over to Cora, who is going to share some updates on what we've accomplished since our annual meeting in October. Cora? Thank you, Rosa. And um, uh, hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are. Um, and uh, yes, so we've been busy, as usual, and it's my pleasure to uh, present a few key um, updates since our last meeting to you right now. So with the next slide, I just wanted to confirm your suspicions uh, that our membership uh, is ever growing. Uh, and in the past um, six months, we had uh, 1,130 new members join us, which is a really good news because obviously um, uh, the more members participate in the kind of rich networks of relationships um, that we're building with metadata for scholarly content, uh, the more robust this research nexus will be um, that we are providing to the scholarly community back for investigating those relationships and, and um, uh, you know, providing opportunities for discovery and assessment and all other parts important for, for this progress of scholarship. Uh, we've been also very pleased to welcome seven new uh, ambassadors to our program. Dr. Sumit uh, Narula from India, uh, Mercury Shitanida uh, from Kenya, uh, Norbo uh, Gelsten from Bhutan, Amber Osman from Pakistan, Itifat uh, Ibrahimov from Azerbaijan, Gulzaina Kasimova from Kazakhstan, and Dr. Muhammad Subani from Pakistan as well as a new community engagement manager, Johansson Obanda, who leads, the, uh, who leads the, the, the entire team. Another part of our community that is always growing is the sponsors program. Uh, it's, uh, we've, we've welcomed eight new sponsors in the past few months, uh, including the first sponsors in Mongolia, Singapore, and Peru. Uh, importantly, the program is now so strong that we had to pause accepting new sponsors uh, in, um, in a few parts of the world where the, there are already um, many uh, for our members to, um, to come to and to choose from. Uh, and that allows us to focus on some areas of greater need, especially countries um, that are eligible for our uh, GEM program, which I will mention in a second as well. Uh, but obviously notwithstanding, our uh, existing sponsors across the world in all the regions that they are present are still taking on new members um, and, uh, and will be kind of helping, uh, supporting them in joining and, and participating in the uh, metadata network in Crossroads. So um, we'll now talk about uh, probably, well, at least to me, it's one of the most exciting developments uh, that has occurred in the last few months. Uh, so we, in January, we have launched our Global Equitable Membership or GEM program. Uh, and this is the program that allows uh, organizations uh, that produce scholarly and professional content uh, that are based in 59 countries, uh, recognized for being least advanced, uh, economically advantaged in the world. 
um, to join Crossref um, without membership fees and also to register their content without content registration fees. And uh, presently we have 268 members. You can see their locations uh, on the map uh, from those countries. And in that, uh, uh, 51 of those have joined us since January. So um, we're really hopeful that we'll be able to welcome many more and uh, help their, um, their content also join our big network for Research Nexus and create all those new relationships with them. Another development that supports this time new publishers uh, is the place or the publishing uh, the publishers learning and community exchange uh, online forum uh, for organizations who wish to adapt uh, best practices and um, standards in scholarly publishing. So working with the other agencies, COPE, the OAJ and OASPA, uh, we have realized that there is a number of different uh, practices and, and standards that publishers are meant to uh, are expected uh, to to adopt for the best of the scholarly community as a whole, uh, and uh, we hope that the forum is kind of like a one stop shop for all the information and also to start conversations with experts and with peers uh, related to any of those um, intricacies of our um, scholarly publishing industry. All right, and the next one is the grant registration form. Uh, which is a tool that we um, uh, developed and made available for uh, our funder members uh, who don't have the knowledge or resources um, to submit their information in XML format. We still encourage XML submissions as far as possible, but this one uh, allows those organizations that don't have that kind of resources uh, to register their grant metadata with Crossref. It's a simple form. You complete it, uh, enter your credentials and receive uh, instant confirmation of your submission. Uh, you can also um, save the information in the form to your local machine, which allows for kind of editing it later on if you need to, as well as uh, creating local templates. Uh, and uh, we're already planning further iteration of this form, expanding to new content types, uh, including that for research articles. And I hope that at this point, it will be relevant and useful for a much wider um, a range of our members in, in the community. Another point that um, we have recently made uh, available is as part of our commitment to the principles of our open uh, scholarly infrastructure, we have migrated our website to the um, to the uh, GitLab, and that allows for all of you in the community, and we invite you uh, very much to do so, uh, to both provide feedback on our website as well as suggest different content. Uh, you can create merge requests or, or uh, tickets uh, for with your feedback for uh, changes that you would like to see. Uh, and uh, I uh, think I can also share with you uh, a link to uh, a recent community forum post where you can uh, find out more about how to participate. In fact, I will, pre I will share a few more community forum posts in a second uh, that relate to the other updates that I've already covered. Uh, but the last point I wanted to, to, to highlight is the um, recently uh, made available preview of our Relationships API endpoint. Uh, this is um, a result of, uh, of merging, uh, of work merging different metadata sources that we have. Um, and uh, it is a significant simplification to the way we process and present um, things like event data. In fact, it will in the future replace that API. Uh, and um, it supports better our citations funding and uh, and uh, online commentary and other, uh, basically any other um, relationships that we have between our metadata. Uh, and at the moment, um, uh, Martin Rickmund has uh, recently uh, posted in the community forum again uh, about uh, the preview uh, with a sample of 10 million relationships that we have available, uh, which is about 1%, I think, uh, of uh, the data that we've made available so far. So that was that was all the updates I wanted to share. Maybe but maybe there is one more from just yesterday uh, that our public data file is now available. But I didn't manage to get the slide in about that. So you can see for yourself. And now over to Amanda for the integrity of scholarly record. Thanks, Cora. Um, hi, everyone. So I'm Amanda Bartel. I look after the member experience team here at Crossref. And I'm going to talk a little today about uh, Crossref's role in preserving the integrity of the scholarly record, um, what we're hearing from the community about this, and also what you can do to help. 
so the integrity of the scholarly record, it, it's kind of a, an important subsection of uh, research integrity, the kind of wider question of research integrity. And pretty much everything we've done since our um, inception has been uh, building towards supporting research, the integrity of the scholarly record. Um, we want to document and clarify that scholarly record and make it openly available through the metadata that we share, um, make it available in machine actionable and scalable form. So those in the community can use this metadata and use this information to make their own decisions about the content um, and the players. Um, and our vision of the research nexus takes this one step further on. Um, you can see the vision on the screen here. Um, or if we just go back one screen, please. Um, so our vision is for there to be a rich and reusable open network of relationships, connecting research organisations, people, things, actions, a scholarly record that the global community can build on forever for the benefit of society. And one of the really key uses of that research nexus is to provide a context for this um, research integrity question. The next slide um, shows an image which just makes it a bit clearer um, what we mean when we say the research nexus vision. And I'll just describe what's on the screen for those who can't see the image. So it's a series of concentric circles in different colors which show the various um, objects and actors um, in the research ecosystem, and also how they act on each other and relate to each other. So do people uh, and organisations create, post, respond, use and fund? Um, and it's these relationships and actions between these various actors and elements that provide really important context. Um, and it's that context, really, that helps um, those in the community make informed decisions about the trustworthiness of content or actors. Um, and maybe even more importantly, it makes it harder for organisations to pass off content as trustworthy if there isn't this wider, this wider context circling it. So we've been um, publishing a series of blogs to explain our role in ISR in a bit more detail over the last few months. And at the bottom of this slide, you can see a link um, where you can access um, all of the blogs in the series. In our very first blog, um, we described our role in ISR. Um, we described how we're focused on enriching metadata to provide more and better trust signals while keeping barriers to membership and participation as low as possible to enable an inclusive scholarly record. So I've already talked about how the research nexus and that enriched metadata can provide the trust signals. And I want to talk a little bit more about why we called out um, keeping barriers to membership and participation low. Um, this is, um, we know without that full research nexus, we won't have the complete picture. So that means we need to encourage as many members of the community as possible to share their information through Crossref. Um, we offer a lot of help now with that. There's support from our sponsors programme and the GEM programme, both of which Cora mentioned earlier. Um, and we also, although we do run checks of um, new applicants for membership, we don't run really in-depth checks. We don't um, check the quality of the content. We don't go in depth to members' publishing processes or business processes, um, because for us, it's key that we can get them into the infrastructure and start communicating and the metadata that they can communicate through our APIs um, allows the community to make decisions about the trustworthiness or otherwise of that organization. But also we're aware that there are some members who maybe um, aren't, aren't privy to um, information about what best practice looks like. Um, and one of the best ways to get them 
involved in that side of things is through membership with Crossref. Um, we have an onboarding program for new members um, and our support staff, our community forum, events like this um, all make a real impact on helping um, helping these new members understand what best practice looks like. So for us, one of the keys for preserving the integrity of the scholarly record is getting organisations into our infrastructure and sharing what best practice looks like. So that's our role. Um, so with that in mind, we started just checking that that role is correct and that we're providing what the community needs in this area. And we started off with a um, round table, which we ran last October um, in Frankfurt to coincide with the Frankfurt Book Fair. We had over 40 invited participants who represented a really wide range of different organisations. We had editors, we had research integrity professionals um, from publishers, we had funders, we had institutions, um, we had government bodies, um, and we also had partner organisations um, such as COPE, OASPA, DOAJ, STM. What we found out from that meeting um, were these kind of key takeaways. So first off, it'll come as no surprise to everybody that it really takes a village to solve the, the problems of research integrity. Um, there really isn't one um, segment of our community who can make a difference. Yes, publishers are key, um, but publishers do need to work in collaboration with funders, with institutions, with authors. Um, and funders are particularly key because they have some very effective levers um, to support uh, research integrity and to encourage best practice and good behaviour. And the funders themselves are keen to get involved. Um, we had attendees at the round table, funders who hadn't originally intended to come along to the book fair, um, but had come along for the round table specifically. So there is that interest from the funders, which is great. Um, and we're working closely with funders. Obviously, funders are now able to become members of Crossref and register identifiers for their grants. And we're working closely with them through our funder advisory group and um, other ways as well. We've already talked about the fact that um, participation is vital, but it's that um, informed participation as well. So continuing to share with our members um, what best practice looks like, um, and also working with third parties on that. Um, Cora mentioned earlier the place, the uh, community group that we've been working on with a, a few other key partners. Um, so that increased participation, but with an understanding of best practice is really, really important. We also know that um, increased metadata is key, but we also know from publishers that collecting and registering more and more metadata with Crossref can come with a cost. Um, and so again, we need to work more closely with our members um, so that we're all understanding the benefits that metadata can be a kind of cost cost benefit analysis, if you will, and particularly reinforcing where increased metadata can help with preserving the integrity um, of the scholarly record, and particularly for research integrity professionals at publishers. Something else we need to work together on is defining what do those trust signals look like, which elements of metadata are the most important and also how can we make it as easy as possible for members to register them with Crossref and once they're registered how do we make them as visible as possible how do we support those using our APIs and other services to make use of that information um, and the uh, relationships endpoint to the API, which Cora talked about earlier, that's a really key starting point there. That's really the way that folks will be able to, to see the research nexus, as it were, through, through the API and start seeing that context to help them identify these trust signals. But there's already one um, item of metadata that we know is very important as a trust signal, and that's retractions and corrections metadata. Uh, our members are able to register this information with us through our Crossmark service, 
but it's underused currently. So again, we need to make work with our members to make them aware of the service and also see if we can make it easier for members to use the service. Um, and we're also working with um, other organisations on this. We're, we're on the uh, NISO CREC group who are going to be making some recommendations about best practice for retractions and corrections soon. So, uh, so watch this space for that. So how can you help? Well, we'd love if you get involved in the conversation. So do put any comments or feedback on the community forum. Um, and obviously ask questions today or in any other Crossref meetings that you might come along to. If you're just getting started working with Crossref, one of the best things you can do is make sure you are adding all of this extra metadata that provides context and relationships for your work when you register metadata with us. So I've left some um, bullets up there of some of the key kind of contextual metadata that if you aren't registering right now, um, do work with your teams and your suppliers to see if you can get these into the metadata that you register. So that's our um, position on ISR, what we're hearing from the uh, community and, and how you can help. And I think I'm now passing over to Martin, who's actually going to be talking about one of those important contextual items, uh, references. Martin. Yeah, hi there. Hi there, everyone. It's really nice to see everybody um, uh, out today. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you might be in the world. So yeah, I'm going to talk a little bit about references. And we made some significant changes to references last year. So we opened all of the references. You used to be able to deposit your um, your, your bibliography alongside a, an article or a book or, or whatever it might be, um, but not make that um, th those references publicly available. We changed it so that now all references are publicly available and more than half of journal articles and nearly 45% of all of our works have references. Um, these are great numbers, but we could believe that these could be even higher. Um, and, you know, we'd love to work with, uh, with the community, uh, with all of you uh, wonderful, enthusiastic people to um, get more references um, for works. And I just want to run through a few of the options that we have and then some of the changes we're making to our cited by service to make it easy to access uh, reference matches as well. Um, so you're able to, if you're using uh, XML to deposit your metadata, that's great. You can deposit references um, there. If you're not using XML, you can still deposit references. Um, you can use our simple text query interface where you can just um, deposit the references in a, in a text uh, block of text, just one reference per line. Um, and then we will do the rest. If you're using OJS or other platforms, there are plugins available to deposit references. Um, and I guess a couple of points about, about sending as reference metadata. You don't need to pass the references. So you don't need to say, OK, these are the authors. This is the title. This is the journal. You can just send an unstructured string of text. That's fine. Um, that's good enough for us. If you have the DOI with the references, that's fantastic. We love DOIs. We love to get DOIs. But if you don't, still send us the reference metadata, and we will do our best to match um, the DOIs to the references um, after you've deposited them. Um, and the last point to make on this slide is that you know references appear in your works if you deposit them. We don't go out looking for them. We don't get the full text. Um, so it really is dependent on, the, on our members to send us the um, reference metadata. Now, why would you want to do that? Um, if we go on to the next slide, there's just a, a few reasons for that. So firstly, um, there's a lot of downstream use of, uh, of reference metadata. There are literally thousands of organizations that are using the reference metadata um, that you send and that are putting in, them into the hands of, for example, researchers who are discovering more interesting content, um, finding out where their research has been reused, getting new ideas and, and building on them. Um, Crossrefs, as I as mentioned earlier, Crossrefs' goal is to make research more findable, linkable, reusable, and so on. Um, and there's really almost no better way to do that than uh, being able to link um, uh, link different research outputs together um, using reference metadata. It's it's really valuable. Um, we all know that references are used widely in the evaluation of of research. Um, that 
Uh, it's also about you know the impact that research has. How is it being reused? Has it been refuted? Has it been built on? Um, you know these are questions that you can answer by you know tracking through how um, uh, how work has been has been referenced and, and cited and, and reused and, and so on. We can go on to the the next slide. So another real benefit of depositing references is that you get the reciprocal benefit um, of other members depositing references, and you can get access to to those. Um, uh, as a member um, via our cited by service. Um, so yeah, you can get citations. The better, the, the better news is that we've just made it easier to get citations. So you used to need to uh, register your references, deposit reference metadata, um, uh, and, and then contact us to enable the cited by service. Now we've removed those steps. So all of our members, this, this will go live in the next couple of days, all of our members will be able to um, use our cited by service without needing to kind of pre-register or um, send your metadata. We highly recommend that you send your references anyway, because then you will get a, you know, you get about a 20% boost in your reference counts by doing that. And you also link to link authors to um, other interesting uh, works that are in your own, um, your own database. So using cited by, you can retrieve all of the uh, metadata that you need to display these references on your website and, and there's just a, a screenshot on the, the right from a, a, a publisher who's who's done this. We've also made it easier for platforms and vendors to access um, citations. Um, if you're working with a platform or vendor um, and you know, you're interested in this, get in touch. You don't need to share credentials anymore. They will be able to use their own, um, their own credentials to access your cited by um, results. You can get in touch via our forum or with our support team about that. Um, so if we can move on to the next slide. Um, hopefully I've persuaded you that you know, now you will benefit from sending us reference metadata and you can benefit from receiving the reference metadata from you know, 17,000 other um, Crossref members. So, yeah, thank you for that. And I uh, can move on to the next section. Wonderful. Next we have uh, Rachel. Uh, Lamy, Director of Product, to talk about uh, the new participation report. Rachel? Cool. Thank you, Rosa. Um, I will get us moving. So can you see my screen OK? Yes. Excellent. Thank you. Um, so you can see that my colleagues are doing a great job of sharing links in the chat. Um, earlier on today, um, when we did the first version of this meeting, we were kind of a victim of our own success because everyone went to look at participation reports, um, the, the labs reports that I'm going to demo, and they had a hiccup. But we've always got um, we've always got a backup um, in place. So thanks for joining us today. Um, I'm Rachel, and I am going to take you on a quick tour of this tool that we're developing as part of our R&D work at Crossref. So first up is that I'm not taking um, credit for the work that's been done to, to, to revisit these reports. Um, it's the product of hard work from the R&D team and we're highlighting it due to its fit with our mission and the way it reflects how we want to work. So, you know, the reason that you're here is that you're part of our community and we want to be open and share our projects early with you so that we can get feedback. Um, it's a pretty lightweight interface that's built on top of our API and information from our other systems. Um, so, including the, the metadata that's registered with members. So some of you are probably familiar with our existing participation reports and might be familiar with um, the format. The aim of our existing participation reports is to highlight key metadata fields, some of which Amanda mentioned in her presentation, and obviously Martin talked about references, but to help our members and the community know what metadata, metadata they're registering with Crossref and areas where they could make it more comprehensive. Um, we think metadata is important. It's tied to the vision of uh, Research Nexus, and we want to help people understand best practices, but also make it easier for people to, to be able to, um, you know, to be able to, to do them. 
Um, the ask from today is, you know, after my colleagues have finished pre presenting, go and have a look at these reports. Let us know what you think, and we can we'll then build on that feedback to improve how we deliver them. This isn't a production service, um, which is why we had a hiccup this morning. Um, so we're keen to um, to continue to develop these alongside your alongside your feedback. So to start the tour, um, what I might want to do here is I can navigate around these reports by searching for a Crossref member. Um, let me look for eLife and let it think. Um, and I can also um, I can also add the content type that I want to choose, the period that I want to look at, and I can look at um, title detail and example links from the information um, the information at hand. Um, if it's taking a while, which is one of the things that is want to do. Then I can jump across and I can take a look at the records that come up for eLife. So it will give me an overview of the information that I have for this specific member, um, the date joined, the where the organization is located, number of DOIs, um, and the prefixes that are associated with that member, including their, their publication history and the types of content that they're registering. So all of this information is, you know, is stored in our systems. So we want to make it really easy for people to see that. There's a sample of, I guess, what we call top level domains. What we mean by that is that often our members can have um, can have data that's um, that sits on um, on lots of different websites. Sometimes, whenever content moves. Um, some of it gets left behind in other places or isn't migrated. So we want to make it really easy for folks to be able to, to find that information and ascertain if everything that they expect to happen, maybe during a title transfer or a platform migration, has happened. We've been playing about with these and adding additional information on quarterly deposits. So um, information on... If you're a Crossref member, we'll send you an invoice quarterly and we'll tell you the, you know, the amount, this is related to the volume of content that you've registered with us. We get members who then want to be able to find out or get a list of the content items that's contributed to that, re to that report. And rather than coming up and need to ask us for those, Hopefully you'll just be able to come here and get that in future. Again, there are um, there are exceptions to that and nuances with how we build. So we're working to, to refine that um, over time. If you're into data citation, you can have a look at the data citation counts. So the, the information that we exchange with data site to show links from um, articles to related data and from the related data back to articles. And my colleague Martin Eve in the in the labs team has been doing work on to try to show um, and dig into the the level of preservation um, that we can see um, that we can see our members adhering to because we want we want the the information um, or the DOIs to to be able to be updated and to resolve persistently over time. And that's not something that we can just do as Crossref. It needs our members to be able to invest in and take the time to be able to update their content. Um, if you're a member, monthly we send you your resolution reports um, and we wanted to be able to share more details on those openly rather than get them in, um, rather than get them via email. So again, there's some details on those in here. We've got things like counts of DOI, and then this is sort of where we're getting to the information that will be really familiar to you from your participation reports. Um, so you can look at things like the coverage across um, for both your publication and as an average against other Crossref members. And what you can do is you can also compare members. 
So you could go and add another member and be able to compare um, how you're doing versus, you know, another another Crossref member. And that's something that people had asked for a lot. Um, so it helps to just give a bit more context. And if you work with a sponsoring organization, then you can add the the a list or a number of the sponsors that you work with and be able to compare across. And um, there's some I wanted to highlight a couple of fields here. Um, again, my colleagues have highlighted areas that are really important, um, license information, ORCID IDs, references. Um, but the reason that these reports are great is that um, they're more responsive to the types of content that we collect. So to add a new field to our current participation reports is a bit, it's a bit cumbersome. So whenever we add new fields to our metadata, so we added ROAR identifiers about two years ago, um, then we'll start to see coverage of those new metadata fields. And again, we'd certainly encourage you to, to look into and think about providing ROAR IDs as part of the metadata that you send Crossref. Same thing for our similarity check service and Crossmark. Um, those are also highlighted here. We've also highlighted um, the fact that, um, that we are increasingly welcoming funder members to join and register grants with us. And again, we can very easily go in and add new content types to these reports because they're just reading from our, from our APIs. So again, I can start to see information from the Wellcome Trust who've registered, how many? 17 and a half thousand um, grants with us. And we can see things like the ORCID IDs and ROAR identifiers are really starting to stack up for those members. And what that means is it enhances the links that we are able to make between the, the content that our members are registering and other types of um, research outputs, grants, data, other, other papers. And that starts to build that, um, continue to build out that picture of the research nexus that, um, that Amanda demonstrated earlier. So I think if we go back to the, to the slides, as I said, my main kind of aim in this is to encourage your um, your feedback, your comments, um, which you can provide um, either in the GitLab um, repository that's connected to these reports. Um, but I'll also add a post to um, a recent demo of these in our community forum by my colleague, Paul. And again, we'd welcome feedback there because this is something that we want to work on over time. We want to know what's going to be useful to you and um, mean that you can self-serve the information that you need from Crossref rather than coming to have to ask for it. So thank you very much. Happy to take questions um, and we'll keep, a we'll keep a look out for those. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rachel. So yes, please add your questions to the Q&A um, and we will be happy to answer those questions. Take a quick look here. Got a couple there. All right then. So I'll move on and we'll have uh, give Patricia Feeney an opportunity to uh, talk about metadata priorities. Thank you. Right. Yeah, so I'm going to go through um, the, the results of a metadata prioritization survey we sent out recently. Um, next slide, please. Um, but before we jump into that, um, we've been gradually expanding the metadata we collect and have seen some increases in registration. Uh, so I thought I'd just highlight that um, while we've got some planning going on, we, we, we still uh, would like to increase the metadata we, we currently uh, collect. Uh, we currently have 144 plus uh, million total records up from 140-ish at the end of last year, which is a good increase. Um, some highlights are that while many members are still in the planning stages, we're seeing more records with ROAR IDs and affiliations and more members overall adopting ROAR. We're seeing more abstracts, references, and grant records being registered as well. Um, we're also seeing an increase in data set records, um, not very many, well, some of them are for data, but many are for not, uh, are not for data because many members register uh, content that we don't 
fully support as data. And we'll touch on that a, a bit later as we go through the results of the survey. Okay, next slide. All right. Um, so we sent out a survey to uh, most members that register members that register metadata with us a few weeks ago. Um, if you haven't seen it, uh, this QR code on the screen links directly to it, and uh, we'll, someone can drop the link in the chat, or I'll do it once I'm done talking. <laughs> um, so this is the first time we've really done a survey like this. Um, the intention is to help prioritize the work um, that we're going to do. There's a lot we want to do. There's a lot you want us to do, but we really want to make sure we're focusing on the projects that will have the most immediate impact now. Um, I, and I do, I know since this is intended to be filled out by members who send us met metadata, we're trying to assess what metadata you have on hand to send us and what you're ready to you know, hit the ground running and send us right away as soon as we start to support something. Um, but we do want to survey metadata users comprehensively in, in the future as well. So if you haven't taken the survey, please do. Uh, but it's open until May 18th, but we have a big chunk of responses so far, and the results were kind of interesting. So I thought I'd run through them in this in this talk um, in this talk just to get give you an idea of what we're seeing so far. Um, again, I haven't done an in-depth analysis that will come once the survey is closed. Okay, next slide. Um, so I wanted to know how our members view the metadata they send to us. Do they just want to send the required basics to get a DOI registered, or do they want to send more metadata in general? Uh, the news overall is good so far. Only 15% answered required minimums. Um, over half of members want to send as much as possible. 7% want to send more. Um, and 22% want to send or are sending just the basics. Next slide. Okay, so, but why are people sending only basics or are not interested in sending more? I asked that as well, just to dig into that a bit. Um, if you don't send as much as possible, what was keeping you from fully contributing? 14% uh, want to provide more, but they have limitations. 27% uh, don't see the point of supplying more metadata. Those are uh, numbers that we really want to reach and, and reach out to and, and figure out what's going on there. 30% uh, don't think the additional metadata, such as funder metadata, references and abstracts, that sort of thing, are relevant to the records they register with us, which may be the case. It may not be the case. It may be that they don't understand what else they can register. So that's also something I want to dig into. And 28% of the respondents want to know more, which is great. And um, a lot of the respondents did supply their email address and identify themselves. So we can do some follow-up there. Okay, next slide. Uh, so I also left some free text space for respondents to share what the roadblocks are. They fall into three categories, no big surprises, lack of time, lack of staff, lack of tra training or knowledge, which overall to me means lack of resources. Again, not a surprise. It confirms a lot of what we thought, but it, it's it's good to have some of the responses got were quite detailed. Um, um, so it's good to have um, some information and uh, as with, you know, Rachel was just talking about um, new reports we're coming up with. We, we we're, we're always looking for ways to make things easier for our members to send metadata. Okay, next slide. So the meat of the survey was asking about projects we have lined up. Um, I, I do wanna say we excluded grant and preprint projects because we've been in touch with those communities that, that their needs are, are a little bit more contained and we have a lot of feedback from those communities. So um, you know, if you've participated in those groups and you've given us ideas and, and we, we, we are working on those, uh, it, it just, um, I, I didn't wanna ask any, everything in the survey because no one would fill it out <laughs> and people would get bored halfway through. Um, there are a few other projects as well that aren't listed that we do intend to do. These are the projects that we want to do, um, but we want to know who needs this now as opposed to this will be useful soon. This would be great if you did this. All right, next slide. Again, more details are forthcoming. 
but there were some clear preferences. The project with the most overall yes or yes if my server service provider supports it response was support for citation types, meaning for um, if you supply uh, citations with a metadata record, you can label the citations with the type of citation it, it, it is. You can say a data citation is a data citation. You can say a software citation is a software citation. If a citation has an identifier, it's, it's easy to tell what kind of citation that is, but otherwise it, it, you're just dealing with some text and it's not always clear what's being cited. And a lot of uh, users of our metadata and, and particularly, particularly with data citation, there's a lot of interest in, in figuring out separating data citations from other citations. Um, that that was followed by uh, multi support for multilingual metadata. We have some basic support, but we'd like to expand it and make it more comprehensive and, and easier to um, retrieve multilingual uh, metadata from us. Um, there was also a lot of support for expanding market um, types for abstracts. Currently, if you send an, an abstract, you can mark it up in JATS XML. But uh, there's an we've had requests to support bits, for example, for books um, to re, to support uh, something that was kind of not following a standard for people who just want to send in free text, that sort of thing. So um, there's a lot of support for that. Um, the most clear, just flat out, yes, because you know if I, I I interpret that as these are the members that are waiting for us to do this. Um, that was a yes for the citation typing of citations, followed by expanded abstract support and multilingual metadata. So those are those, those obviously have a lot of support. The most no responses was for conference event identifiers, which makes sense because the community that's interested in that is a little more contained. We only have so many members who um, would be responsible for registering conference event identifiers. But there are also no's for multilingual metadata and abstract support. So um, that, I thought that was kind of interesting. You either love it or you don't. Um, so I will say all project, projects overall got yeses in the 50% to 64% range. Um, again, we'll be doing a more detailed analysis and a blog post and other out outreach about this. All right, next slide. Um, so I also asked what more we could support, and the responses were um, divided into three categories. This is a free text response, so, though, so there, there's a lot to, to dig into, but I was able to, to summarize a lot of that. So the three categories were new record types. Um, we had a lot of requests that expand support for specific resources. Earlier, I mentioned we were seeing an increase in uh, uh, data set reg record registrations. I think those are members who aren't able to fit their records into, you know, they're not registering journals or books or dissertations, so they're putting it in data sets because that is the most um, flexible metadata. Um, so some of these listed actually we support now, so some, someone did ask that we support data sets, which we already do, but there's also a need to support a wider range of objects, uh, like a range of open educational resources, maps, zines, comments, Comics. There are a lot of requests for humanities-related content. I had that that from a few um, respondents. We are we were also asked to expand identifier support, which is definitely something we'd like to do. And there are also some requests to expand metadata, including for digital preservation status, which is exciting because uh, Martin Eve on our research and development team has been doing a, a lot of work on that, and you can actually see some of that starting to um, show up in our labs API. Um, so if you hit forward, um, we'll reveal the answer to the most requests of just I go back to the last slide. Um, yeah, yeah. So the answer to the most requested, uh, thing in this section was, uh, what was the most requested? It was keywords. We've gotten asked a lot for that overall in the past, and we have resisted supporting this because it's, it's kind of, um, a bit chaotic. There isn't a strict vocabulary and all that, but um, in my opinion, it's worth taking another look in the context of the research nexus we're building. So I, I suppose that's good, that's good um, news for all of you who are interested in supplying keywords within our metadata. All right, 
Um, next slide. Okay, as I mentioned, there were some things that we didn't include in the survey. Um, there, there are a lot of smaller things, but um, I'd say as far as um, projects that we do are planning to do, um, we've had a lot of requests for statements, particularly data availability, availability, availability statements, um, but also acknowledgements and some other types of statements. We'd like to support that. Um, we've had ex requests to expand the journal meta level metadata we collect, for example, uh, collect information about peer review policies. I think we'd like to do that, but I think that's, that's I wouldn't say long term, more medium term, not short term, because we, we need to do a lot of uh, planning and, and conversing with the community before we start just actually supporting that. Um, we want to support versioning. Um, I, there's a NISO working group for journal article versioning that's going to issue recommendations. So I think that will help shape what we we support for that. And again, we're also planning to do um, some updates to support our preprint and grants. Um, and, and funder members. And so that's about it. Um, if anyone has any questions about the survey or want to follow up, follow up please feel free to reach out to me. Thanks. Excellent, thank you very much. And next we are going to have uh, Cora. All right, thank you. Thank you, Patricia. And thank you um, to all the other speakers as well. Uh, so now, well, we only have um, seven minutes left, uh, but I'm hoping that we'll, this uh, will be at least a start to a conversation about metadata completeness. Uh, so if you have a question about any of the topics that have been covered today or, or about metadata completeness in general, uh, then please do still add it to, you, to the Q&A box. Uh, and um, if you wish to uh, or have um, a reflection about metadata completeness, whether it's good examples or barriers and challenges to, to making it happen or opportunities and ideas about how it can be used in the richer metadata we have, then please uh, drop that in the chat or also you can raise your hand um, and we can uh, unmute you or you can even unmute yourself uh, to, uh, to ask aloud. All right, I can see that there is a question coming out right now. What is the status of the metadata manager? Uh, I think Rachel is already taking that, but Rachel, would you just uh, answer aloud now? Of course, um, yeah, this came up this morning as well. So um, earlier in the um, earlier in the, the session, Cora highlighted um, a grants registration form um, that supports sort of um, non-XML deposit of grant metadata. Um, the next step for that form is we're getting people to try it out, um, but we're also um, laying the groundwork for extending that to support journal articles as the next step. And um, so that's what is going to be the replacement to Metadata Manager that, um, that we'll then plan to, um, to deprecate or to remove, I guess later this year we've we we put up that we that we were going to that we've that we're we plan to do this for some time, but we want to have a good replacement um, in order to be able to do that. But we're a lot closer to that now with the grants form, um, so we'll we'll update more um, in the next couple of months. Thank you, Rachel. Um, okay, well, we have another question from Lou Bao, uh, which I'll uh, uh, read out in a second. In the meantime, I just wanted to say that there was a lot of questions this morning in the call about um, adding credit metadata. So I wonder if Patricia, you might want to say a few words about that and, and whether there's been any indication in the um, survey about the community readiness for that. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think that 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 was included in the survey and there were, there were a fair number, I don't remember the exact percentage, I think it was it ranked kind of in the middle priority wise. So what we need to do is well, well, see, it's not a scientific survey, but it'll wait till the survey um, is ended and then we'll assess what people are asking for us for and how easy it is to implement these things. I will say we already have a credit support for expanding roles and credit plan ready to go. 
So I feel good about that, but um, we can't really commit to anything <laughs> until it's all we, we meet and discuss and figure out how it fits in with other work we're doing. All right, excellent. Thank you, Patricia. Um, okay, so um, the question I have here is about uh, the new labs report, I believe. Uh, um, Lou Ballo says he uh, couldn't find data for their journal, the Precision Nanomedicine in Crossref Labs report, and what might be the reason for that? So I will um, I will have a look. The, the labs reports at the top level is connected to the um, to the to the member name. So you've got the journal name there that might be different to the um, that might be different to the member name that we have for you in our system. And then you can drill down from the member information into the detail on the specific journal. Um, but I will have a look now um, and see if we can track it down. Thank you, Rachel. And in the meantime, uh, Roberto uh, Camargo, um, apologies if I am mispronunciating anybody's name. Uh, I am trying the best I can uh, and don't, um, don't hesitate to correct me if I'm wrong. But uh, the question here is uh, something about publishers ask uh, for a tool to make depositing easier for Crossmark. Uh, and I wonder whether we have any good answer for that. Uh, I think Martin is still in the call with us. Maybe we would be able to shed some light on Crossmark. Yeah, yes, we are, we have been looking at cross uh, crossmark to um, uh, to see how we can can modify it to make things a little bit easier, maybe even change some of the the structure of the metadata. Um, that's still a fairly early stage. Um, we we we're expecting to do some consultation um, later this year um, about that. If you've got feedback for what specific you find difficult, um, I would love to hear it. Um, there is now, I think since last year or maybe the year before, there is a uh, a plugin for Crossmark for OJS users, um, which which can make things a little bit easier. Um, but yeah, we're aware that there are some difficulties, and we you know we we would like to um, uh, to make it easier to deposit this kind of material because it is very important to know what kind of updates and, and retractions happen to, um, uh, to to metadata records. All right, thank you, Martin. Uh, okay, so I think there was just one question about how frequently one should update metadata. Uh, and the question was specifically about OJS, but I think overall uh, my team, uh, my teammates have um, uh, jumped on this straight away. There are no limitations. Uh, you can, um, basically we would hope that the metadata for all your content is always as uh, comprehensive and, and as representative of that content as possible. So we encourage um, uh, updates as and when uh, anything can be improved, augmented or added. Uh, and remember that all of those um, metadata updates to existing DOIs are free of charge. So I think that will be our last question uh, because we have now reached the full hour. Uh, thank you everyone for participating and I'm, uh, uh, I think, passing on back to Rosa. Oh, wonderful. Thank you very much. Yes. So um, if you wish to continue the conversations with us, um, uh, you can find us on Mastodon. We are also still on Twitter. Uh, but uh, most of all, please join us on our community forum. Uh, most of the topics we talked about today are posted there, and we encourage you to continue the conversations with, with us there. Get in touch with us at our feedback uh, email. And also uh, consider subscribing to our newsletter, which you can find at the footer of our website. Thank you to all the presenters and colleagues who are helping to answer the questions today. We will follow up with you in a few days with a recording and some slides. And uh, thank you for joining us today. Be well and bye for now. Thank you, everyone.